Hi there. In this video, we are going to learn about cysts of the jaws. In the body, cysts are most commonly seen in the jaws. In your clinical practice, you will frequently find cysts on radiographic examinations. Some cysts require aggressive treatment, while some other require conservative approach. While most cysts require a histopathological examination, for some cysts, a histopathological examination is not recommended. More on that later. Most of the time, a cyst will be initially recognized on a radiograph. Therefore, it's extremely important that we learn the radiographic features of cysts and learn how to develop a good differential diagnosis and understand how cysts are managed. Without much delay, let's begin with learning the definition of a cyst. A cyst has four essential features. All these features should be met to arrive at a diagnosis of a cyst. First, it is a pathological cavity. The sinus cavity, the nasal cavity or the oral cavity are not pathological cavities. A cyst has to be an enclosed pathological cavity. It has to be filled with fluid. If there is a cavity filled with air or soft tissues, it is not a cyst. A cavity in a tooth from caries is not a cyst. Internal resorption of a tooth, although an enclosed pathological cavity, is also not a cyst. The cyst should be lined by epithelium. Finally, a cyst has to have a connective tissue wall. These four features define a cyst. Most of the cysts are in the bone. For this radiology lecture, we are going to skip on cysts in the soft tissues. All these features are based on histological finding. On a radiographic examination, all that we will identify is a pathological cavity. The cavity will have distinct radiographic features. In this video, we'll identify the radiographic features of a cyst. These features are important for making a diagnosis. As we mentioned earlier, most of the jaw cysts are inside the bone. Today we are going to skip cysts in the soft tissues. Rarely there will be a cyst in the condyle or in the coronoid process. Later, we will learn about a pathological cavity in the condyle known as subcortical pseudocyst. That is not a fluid-filled epithelium lined cavity. So we'll call that cavity as a pseudocyst. The odontogenic cysts occur in the tooth-bearing areas. You will find a cyst with well-defined borders. The margins of the cysts are easily visible. The border is smooth. If you find a cavity with an irregular border, it's probably not a cyst. Most of the cysts will have a corticated margin. A corticated margin is a crisp white line. If the cyst becomes infected, the margin may become irregular and can even become sclerotic. The sclerotic border is a thick, irregular cortical margin. The fine crisp line of a cortication is lost in areas of sclerosis and is replaced by an irregular radiopaque band. Let's talk about the shape of a cyst. A cyst, when small, is spherical. If you take a two-dimensional image, such as a periapical radiograph or a panoramic, a small cyst will have a circular appearance. When the cyst becomes larger and contacts a hard surface, such as cortical bone, the walls of the inferior alveolar canal, the sinus floor or roots, it may start to become oval. Later, we'll also see that the odontogenic keratocyst may take the shape of a tunnel more like the shape of a hot dog. Some cysts may have a scalloped border, something like the outer border of a seashell. Consider a cyst as a soap bubble floating in the air. These are perfectly spherical. If we have a hard surface and a soap bubble lands on this, this will not remain spherical. It becomes oval. On a 2D image, where you cannot see the buccal and lingual cortical plates, if you see a cyst has taken an oval shape, you can assume that the cyst may be touching the buccal or the lingual or both the cortical plates. A cyst grows 
slowly. If we see a cyst with a few centimeters diameter, it may have taken several months or more than a year to reach that size. While it grows, it may displace the roots of the adjoining teeth. Sometimes it will also resolve the roots. From our knowledge of orthodontics, we know that a significant amount of force is needed to displace a tooth. And also, it takes several months of force to move the tooth. While expanding, a cyst will also displace the inferior alveolar canal or the sinus floor. A cyst is fluid-filled balloon. As the balloon is filled with more and more fluid, there is hydraulic pressure. Usually, the adjacent structures are displaced equally. Because it's a balloon, the borders are smooth and sharp. On cross-sectional images, you may see an expansion of the cortical plates. These cortical plates may become very thin or may even become perforated. Let's talk a little bit about the radiographic appearance of a cyst. If you see a radiolucency inside the bone, it means that there is loss of bone. A radiolucent lesion may be a cyst, may be a benign tumor, may be infection or may even be cancer. With cancer and infection, the border will be irregular. A distinct border means that the lesion is slow growing. A distinct border also means that the lesion is filled with fluid or soft tissues. In our next unit, when we discuss benign tumors, we will see that the most benign tumors, which are filled with soft tissues, also have a distinct border. The smooth, concentric growth of the lesion tells us that there is fluid exerting hydraulic pressure. The border may be distinctly corticated or may have a faint outline. Let's consider the cyst as an egg with a distinctly smooth, hard surface. Let's discuss the actual effect. If we have a large cyst and the X-ray beam travels through a long surface of the cyst and may appear as a well-corticated border on this yellow band that represents an X-ray film. If the cyst is small, the X-ray beam travels through a short surface and may not appear distinctly corticated. So on your radiograph, a large cyst may have a distinct border and a small cyst may have a faint border. With this foundation of knowledge, let's proceed to learn about different kinds of cysts. We may divide cysts into three broad categories, inflammatory, developmental, and other lesions that may look like a cyst. On this screen, we have a simple classification. There are a few more cysts which are rare and we are not going to discuss those. We'll start with inflammatory cysts. There are three broad types of inflammatory cysts. The first is a radicular cyst, which can be either an apical cyst or a lateral cyst arising from an accessory pulp canal. We may also have a residual cyst, most commonly a residual radicular cyst. In such a case, a tooth is missing and the radicular cyst remains, so it's a residual cyst. The third type is an inflammatory collateral cyst. This can be a buccal bifurcation cyst or a paradental cyst. We are not going to discuss all the cysts that I have listed. The cysts that we'll discuss today are the most common. We'll start with the radicular cyst. We'll also discuss the residual cyst. Then we'll proceed with buccal bifurcation cyst. We'll spend some time learning about dentigerous cyst. Then we'll discuss lateral periodontal cyst. After that, we'll briefly discuss the glandular odontogenic cyst, not a very common cyst. We'll spend quite some time discussing odontogenic keratocyst or OKC. This is an aggressive cyst and it requires our full attention. All these cysts are odontogenic. After this, we'll discuss a non-odontogenic cyst, the nasopalatine duct cyst. Finally, we'll discuss two conditions that are not true cyst. One is a simple bone cyst. Note that in this graphics, I have not filled up this cavity with yellow color. This cyst is rather a pseudocyst, is not filled with fluid. 
Finally, we will discuss another pseudocyst in the maxillary sinus, the mucus retention cyst. Here is news that you did not want to hear. We are going to do some active learning. Please take out your pen and paper and answer these questions without going back to the first part of the video. Ready? Let's start. A cyst has a wall made of A cyst is lined by A cyst is what kind of cavity? And A cyst is filled with Excellent! Let's proceed. Let's start with radicular cyst. This cyst is around the apices of a tooth and the tooth may be carious. A radicular cyst is known by different names. A radical is a root. Because of the location, this cyst is also known as a periapical cyst or apical periodontal cyst. In the medical literature, it is sometimes known as a dental cyst. We should be familiar with all these names. This is how radicular cyst forms. It starts with inflammatory products from a non-vital tooth. The epithelial cells of malaise proliferate and undergo a cystic transformation. Slowly, the fluid generates hydraulic or osmotic pressure. The cystic lesion continues to expand. Clinically, a radicular cyst is found at any age. However, most of the patients are in the third to sixth decade of life. This is the only cyst associated with a non-vital tooth. The involved tooth may show signs of caries or large restoration. There may be history of trauma to the tooth. The cyst continues to expand without any symptoms unless it is infected. Therefore, many times the radicular cyst is an incidental finding during a radiographic examination. These are the radiographic features of a radicular cyst. We will try to use the principles of radiographic interpretation in identifying the features of a cyst. In a previous video, we have talked about radiographic features based on the location, density, border, size, shape, internal content, and effects on the neighboring structures. Let's start with the location of the cyst. Most of the time, the cyst is around the apex of the involved tooth. Occasionally, when the lesion arises from an accessory canal, the cyst may be lateral to the root. Statistical analysis reveals that about 60% of the radicular cysts are seen in the maxilla. The border of the radicular cyst has the same features as most other cysts. The borders are well defined and corticated. If the cyst becomes infected, there may be loss of cortication. If the cyst is small, the cortex is thin. The shape of a radicular cyst has the same features as most other cysts. Small cysts are circular, large cysts are oval. Based on the principles of radiographic interpretation, let's also briefly talk about the size of a radicular cyst. A small radicular cyst can be difficult to differentiate from a granuloma or an abscess. Radiographically, if the lesion is small, you may want to use the term apical periodontitis, which is a term that includes a radicular cyst, a periapical granuloma, and an apical abscess. However, if you see a lesion in the periapical area and it is wider than 2 cm, there is a likelihood that this is a radicular cyst. Internal content. Like most other cysts, there is no radiopaque entity. On most dental radiography, the fluid content of the cyst cannot be detected. In older cysts, there may be faint traces of calcifications. As you recall, the most important radiographic feature of a lesion is its effects on the neighboring structures. Like most other cysts, the radicular cyst will displace roots of the adjoining teeth. Some roots may undergo resorption. 
it can displace the buccal or lingual cortical plates. If the cyst is in the maxillary posterior region, the sinus floor may be elevated. If the cyst is in the mandibular posterior region, the inferior alveolar canal may be displaced. For the differential diagnosis of a radicular cyst, we have to include a periapical granuloma or an abscess. If the lesion is small, radiographically it is difficult to differentiate these three lesions. If we have a radicular cyst arising from an accessory canal, we need to differentiate a lateral radicular cyst from a lateral periodontal cyst. We'll be discussing the lateral periodontal cyst later in this video. Frequently, odontogenic keratocyst may appear as a radicular cyst. For management, a small radicular cyst may be treated by root canal therapy. In some situations, endodontic surgery is needed to remove the cyst and to manage the apical part of the root with unfilled canals. Extraction of the tooth causing the cyst may also be needed. Once a radicular cyst is removed, recurrence is uncommon. In an earlier video, we had used this panoramic radiograph to identify the features of a radicular cyst. We can see a well-defined oval radiolucent lesion with a corticated margin present around the epices of mandibular left first molar which is carious. This lesion has displaced the root of the second molar as well as the inferior alveolar canal. On this periapical radiograph, we see another example of a radicular cyst associated with a non-vital tooth. The apical few millimeters of the root canal is not obturated. If we trace the lamina dura on the mesial aspect of this canine, the lamina dura stops at the level of the lesion. Superiorly, this lesion is in contact with the floor of the nasal fossa. In the area of the contact, the lesion is slightly flat. So the lesion has sort of an oval appearance. We have a CBCT scan of the same patient. Let's review the CBCT scan to understand the effects on the labial and palatal cortical plates. We have a small field of view CBCT scan of the maxillary right posterior region. This is our tooth of interest. And here is the cross section. This blue line represents the image on this window. Let's look at this particular window for our cyst evaluation. Right now, we are making a section through the premolar. The non-vital tooth is the canine. So as we come mesially, we start to pick up the cyst. The superior border of the cyst is at the level of the sinus floor. This is the labial cortical plate and this is the palatal cortical plate. Coming mesially, we picked up the canine this is the endodontically treated tooth and here is a cyst around the apex of the tooth. The palatal cortical plate is thin or may be perforated and that's the floor of the maxillary sinus. This is the floor of the nasal fossa. Coming further mesially, we can see that the palatal cortical plate is disrupted. Probably the soft tissue is slightly enlarged. Further mesially, this is the cyst slight expansion of the labial cortical plate and perforation of the palatal cortical plate reaching towards the lateral incisor and here the cyst ends. On the axial view on this window and we are looking at this blue line, this, this blue line represents the section on this window. And again we can see an oval appearance of the cyst here is the area of perforation. This is the nasopalatine canal. Further superiorly, this is fairly smooth, well-defined cystic lesion. And this is the right maxillary sinus. On this panoramic radiograph, we have a metallic restoration on the mandibular left first molar. When a vitality test was performed, this tooth was non-vital. Remember that a radicular cyst is the only cyst associated with a non-vital tooth superimposed over the root is a circular radiolucency with well-defined border. The border is slightly thicker. We will call this as a sclerosis of the wall of the lesion. 
Let's look at another radiograph to see a different finding of the cystic wall. Again, we have another radiograph with a lesion with mandibular left first molar. No, it's not that the left first molars will have a higher incidence of radicular cyst. This tooth has a large carious lesion on the distal aspect. The radiolucent defects are arising from both the roots. The margins are not corticated. Let's review another CBCT scan to understand a radicular cyst better. Here is another case of a radicular cyst, again with a mandibular left first molar which is carious. And this is the area that we are looking at. This blue line represents the image on this screen and this blue line represents the axial slice on this particular screen. So you can see the crown is carious and this is the radicular cyst. Let me make the image a little larger so that you can appreciate it better. So this is the cystic outline. This is the inferior alveolar canal. As we come mesially, the lingual cortical plate is thin. This is the buccal cortical plate. Going posteriorly, here is thinning and probable perforation of the lingual cortical plate. The second molar is displaced lingually, tipped lingually. So this is the radicular cyst. If we look at the axial slices, you can appreciate the length of the cyst and with perforation here. And this is the second molar which is tipped lingually. This is the third molar. This is the carious first molar. This is the radicular cyst associated with a carious first molar. Let's proceed to another inflammatory odontogenic cyst. As the name suggests, this is a cyst where the offending tooth is now missing. So in this figure, one molar is missing. The cyst is in the periapical area of a missing second molar and we'll call this as a residual cyst. Again, a residual cyst is a remaining cyst after removal of the original cyst. Most of the time, the original cyst was a radicular cyst. There will be a history of extraction of the tooth that caused the radicular cyst. Most of the residual cysts are asymptomatic. These are incidentally identified on a radiograph acquired for other reasons. Similar to a radicular cyst, if a residual cyst is infected, the patient may have pain. The location of a residual radicular cyst is rather easy to identify. It is in an area of a missing tooth. Because most residual cysts originate from a radicular cyst, you will see such a cyst at the level of the epices of the neighboring teeth. The radiographic features such as border, size, shape, internal content and effects on the neighboring structures are the same as radicular cysts. For differential diagnosis, if previous radiographic examination had no signs of a radicular cyst, a radiolucency in an edentulous area might also be an odontogenic keratocyst. Similar to a solitary lesion as a radicular cyst, there is also a solitary lesion known as salivary gland depression. The salivary gland depression is inferior to the inferior alveolar canal. Most of the residual radicular cysts in the mandible are at the level of the canal or superior to the canal. The treatment of a residual cyst is same as a radicular cyst. Surely since there is no tooth, we have no option of doing a root canal therapy or an extraction. The residual cyst is surgically removed. If the cyst is large, a marsupialization may be needed for the treatment. Let me show you this panoramic radiograph as an example of a residual cyst. We have a circular radiolucent defect in the edentulous region of the mandibular right second premolar. The lesion has a well corticated border. It's located at the level of the apex of the first premolar. So this would be a residual radicular cyst. Here is another residual cyst on the floor of the left maxillary sinus. The source of this cyst was the first molar which is now missing. 
On the other side, we see a second molar that has a large carious lesion. This peripical lesion does not have a circular or oval appearance. Therefore, based on this panoramic radiograph, we are unable to call this lesion as a radicular cyst. We will call this as apical periodontitis to include peripical abscess and peripical granuloma in the differential. Let us review a CBCT scan for a patient who has a residual cyst on the maxillary arch. You can see that the patient has multiple missing teeth. There is a fixed partial denture. This blue line is at the level of the maxillary right lateral incisor and this is the cross section here. As we scroll mesially, this is the nasopalatine canal and here is the residual cyst. We are calling this as a residual cyst because there is no tooth left. All the teeth are missing. So that's the nasopalatine canal. This is the labial cortical plate and this is the heart palate. We are seeing the dorsum of the tongue, lower lip and upper lip. And this is the inferior nasal turbinate. The labial cortical plate is thin or probably perforated. The cyst has also perforated the wall of the nasopalatine canal. Further measly, this is the size of the cyst. So you can appreciate expansion on the palatal cortical plate, expansion on the labial cortical plate, as well as expansion of the floor of the nasal fossa. So this is a residual cyst. Let's review the timeline. We have completed two cysts, radicular and residual. Let's progress to the buccal bifurcation cyst. This is the third type of inflammatory odontogenic cyst, the buccal bifurcation cyst. It is a cyst that happens on the buccal aspect of mandibular molars, mostly in the region of the first molar, sometimes in the region of the second molar. It is in the area of the bifurcation. On a radiograph, a radicular cyst is around the epiphysis. A buccal bifurcation cyst is located slightly distal to the roots. Although the buccal bifurcation cyst is categorized as an inflammatory cyst, the etiology is unknown and inflammation is not always present. The current understanding is that the cyst arises from epithelial cell rests in the pedial spaces on the buccal aspect of the mandibular molars. The inflammatory process may start when the mandibular molar erupts. The mechanism is not fully understood. The buccal bifurcation cyst or BBC is also known as mandibular infected buccal cyst. Although some literature has suggested a buccal bifurcation cyst is the same as a paradental cyst, most authors consider a paradental cyst as a separate lesion. This is not a buccal bifurcation cyst. There are several distinct features of a buccal bifurcation cyst. Most of these cysts occur in children between 5 to 13 years of age. The eruption of the first molar or the second molar may be delayed. Clinically, the crown appears tipped with the lingual cusps higher than the buccal. The affected tooth is vital. In some patients, there may be some buccal swelling. On a two-dimensional radiographic examination, you will most commonly identify a buccal bifurcation cyst superimposed over the roots of the mandibular first molar. If you have a cross-sectional imaging, this lesion is on the buccal aspect. Less commonly, the cyst may be on the buccal aspect of the mandibular second molar. On a periapical or a panoramic radiograph, the lesion appears slightly distal to the furcation area. In some patients, buccal bifurcation cyst or BBC can be bilateral, making an acronym of BBBC. Similar to other cysts, a buccal bifurcation cyst has a well-defined corticated margin. However, this cyst often gets infected and the wall becomes sclerosed. As this cyst enlarges, 
It affects the position of the root and the crown. On cross-sectional images, the crown of the affected molar tips buckly. The lingual cusps of the affected molar will appear higher than the buccal cusps. The roots of the affected molar are displaced towards the lingual cortical plate. For your differential diagnosis of a buccal bifurcation cyst, you should consider a radicular cyst. However, a radicular cyst is around the apices of the molar, and the tooth will have signs of being non-vital. The crown will have signs of large curious lesion or a large restoration. In the case of buccal bifurcation cyst, the tooth is vital. Some authors consider the periodontal cyst as a synonym for the buccal bifurcation cyst. A periodontal cyst happens later in life, in the third decade, while the buccal bifurcation cyst happens in children aged 5 to 13 years. Also, a periodontal cyst is found distal to the third molars, not in the same area that we see a buccal bifurcation cyst. Sometimes, a dentigerous cyst arising from an impacted molar may extend mesially and may give the appearance of a buccal bifurcation cyst. So how do we manage a buccal bifurcation cyst? Histopathological examination is recommended for most cysts. A buccal bifurcation cyst is an exception. The microscopic features are nonspecific. Therefore, histopathological examination is not recommended for buccal bifurcation cyst. This cyst is diagnosed based on clinical and radiographic findings. The cyst may be treated with conservative curettage. Sometimes there is spontaneous resolution without any surgical intervention. The affected tooth should not be extracted. There is no recurrence of this cyst. This panoramic radiograph belongs to a child in mixed dentition. The buccal bifurcation cyst is a well-defined corticated radiolucency visible between the roots of the mandibular first and second molars on the right side. Compared to the left side, the right second molar appears a few millimeters distally displaced. This panoramic radiograph acquired in December 2011 shows several diagnostic findings of a buccal bifurcation cyst on the right side. Compared to the left first molar, the eruption of the right first molar is delayed. Also, it seems that the crown of the first molar is tipped, as we can almost see the occlusal table. Compared to the left side, the right second molar is distally displaced. There is a radiolucency surrounded by sclerotic bone. As we mentioned earlier, frequently a buccal bifurcation cyst becomes infected. For this patient, a biopsy was conducted without any definite histopathological diagnosis. This is the same patient a few months later. No treatment was provided except for the biopsy. Probably the biopsy worked as the treatment because it ruptured the cystic outline. The first molar is now better erupted. The second molar is drifting closer to the first molar. The radiolucent defect has almost healed in this six month period. Now it is a time to review a CBCT scan to see the buccal or lingual relationship of the cyst to the tooth. Let us review this mandibular scan for a buccal bifurcation cyst. The patient is in mixed dentition. The buccal bifurcation cyst is around the roots of the first molar. This is the cross section and we, our cross section is through the deciduous molar and this is the premolar, second premolar. As we go distally, we started picking up the crown of the mandibular right first molar and we can see that the root is in contact with the lingual cortical plate. This is the buccal cortical plate and here is the buccal bifurcation cyst. You can see that the cyst has pushed the root of the molar to the lingual cortical plate. This is the lingual cusp and that's the buccal cusp. The lingual cusp is higher than the buccal cusp. And here is the buccal bifurcation cyst. Let's do some more active learning. Please keep your pen and paper handy. Please answer these questions without going back to the first part of the video. 
Ready? Let's start. How can you differentiate a reticular cyst from a buccal bifurcation cyst? List as many radiographic features as you can. A biopsy is not recommended for what kind of cyst? What does a sclerotic border of a cyst signify? Now that we have covered the inflammatory cysts of the jaws, let us continue with the developmental odontogenic cysts. There are several types of developmental odontogenic cysts. We'll review the most common ones. We'll start with dentigerous cyst. There is a soft tissue variant of a dentigerous cyst known as an eruption cyst. We'll skip this one. We'll also learn about odontogenic keratocyst, lateral periodontal cyst, and a glandular odontogenic cyst. Finally, we'll discuss a developmental cyst of non-odontogenic origin, the nasopalatin duct cyst. Let's proceed with dentigerous cyst. A dentigerous cyst is a developmental cyst around the crown of an impacted tooth. This cyst will attach at the cementoenamel junction of the impacted tooth. Most commonly, a dentigerous cyst is considered a developmental cyst. However, in some cases, there are suggestions of inflammatory origin. This cyst develops when fluid accumulates between the crowns and the epithelium, or there is fluid in the layers of the epithelium. The soft tissue variant of dentigerous cyst is called an eruption cyst. Because this cyst is a transformation of the dental follicle, it is also known as follicular cyst. A radicular cyst is the most common cyst. The dentigerous cyst is the second most common cyst and the most common developmental cyst. This cyst is associated with the crown of an impacted or unerupted tooth. Most dentigerous cysts are with permanent teeth. Sometimes a dentigerous cyst can happen in deciduous dentition. A dentigerous cyst can happen with a supernumerary tooth or even with an odontoma. Again, we are going to describe the dentigerous cyst using the standard radiographic features, the location, border, density, size, shape, internal content, and effects on the neighboring structures. The most common location for a dentigerous cyst is the mandibular third molar and the maxillary canine. These teeth are most commonly impacted. A dentigerous cyst can happen with any tooth that is impacted. The border of the cyst attaches at the cementoenamel junction. In relationship to the tooth, a dentigerous cyst can be central, lateral, or circumferential. More on that in a few minutes. The radiographic features of the border of a dentigerous cyst is similar to other cysts. This cyst also has a well-defined corticated border, similar to other cysts. If a dentigerous cyst is infected, the corticated margin is lost and can become sclerosed. A small dentigerous cyst may have a thin cortical margin. Again, similar to other cysts, the outline of a dentigerous cyst is circular. If the cyst is large, it may acquire an oval appearance. These are the three radiographic variants of the shape of a dentigerous cyst. The first is a central appearance, where the tooth is near the center of the cyst. The lateral variety, the cyst is more towards one side of the tooth. The circumferential cyst is a large cyst that may appear originating apical from the CEG. Histologically, the cystic wall is still attached to the CEG, but the thin cystic lining may not be visible on a radiograph. And we have a few radiographs that shows something similar to this or even the cyst lining appears near the apex. Similar to any other cyst, initially a dentigerous cyst is small. On a periapical radiograph, if a follicle is wider than 3 mm, that follicle is likely to be a dentigerous cyst. As the cyst progresses, it can become very large, occupying a large part of the jaw. 
The density of a dentigerous cyst, like any other cyst, is radiolucent. The only internal component of a dentigerous cyst is the crown of the impacted tooth. Similar to any other lesion, whether cyst or any other kind of pathology, it's important for us to appreciate the effects of the lesion on the adjacent structures. A dentigerous cyst is an expensile lesion. It can cause significant displacement of the involved tooth. Sometimes the impacted molar is displaced towards the inferior border of the mandible. The roots of the adjacent teeth may be resorbed. If the dentigerous cyst is in the maxillary arch, the sinus floor may be displaced. The cortical plates and the inferior border of the mandible can be expanded. In the mandibular arch, the displacement of the inferior alveolar canal is common. The differential diagnosis of a dentigerous cyst includes a hyperplastic follicle. As mentioned earlier, a follicle wider than 3 mm is likely to be a dentigerous cyst. Often, Odontogenic keratocyst and a dentigerous cyst can be difficult to differentiate based on radiographic features only. Unicystic amyloblastoma may also have radiographic features of a dentigerous cyst. The management of a dentigerous cyst includes surgical removal of the cyst with or without the involved tooth. A histopathological examination of a suspected dentigerous cyst is strongly recommended. Earlier, we discussed that a histopathological examination should not be conducted for a buccal bifurcation cyst. A dentigerous cyst is very different. A lesion that may radiographically look like a dentigerous cyst can be an odontogenic keratocyst or a unicystic amyloblastoma. These two conditions require aggressive treatment. Therefore, it's essential that we diagnose the lesion properly whether it's a dentigerous cyst or OKC or amyloblastoma. In addition, a dentigerous cyst can give rise to a mural amyloblastoma. In some cases, squamous cell carcinoma and mucoepidermoid carcinoma have been reported to arise from a dentigerous cyst. Let's review this cystic lesion on this cropped panoramic radiograph. The mandibular left third molar is vertically impacted. We have a well-defined radiolucent lesion arising from the CEG of the molar. The margin is corticated. This is an example of a lateral variety of the dentigerous cyst. This lesion is also in contact with the inferior alveolar canal. Here is an example of a large dentigerous cyst on the cropped panoramic radiograph. The right third molar is horizontally impacted. The occlusal surface is a few millimeters away from the root of the second molar. This is a circumferential variant of a dentigerous cyst due to its large size. It almost seems that the cyst extends to the apical region of the third molar. Mesially, this lesion is near the roots of the first molar. The distal root is partially resorbed. The roots of the second molar may also be partially resorbed. We can see that the inferior border of the mandible is thin. The inferior alveolar canal is also displaced inferiorly. Let's review this case on a CBCT scan. This is the CBCT scan of the mandibular arch of the same patient. We can see that this is the dentigerous cyst and our slice is in the region of the first molar here. As we go distally, this is the distal root and we can see that the distal root is resorbed. Further distally, we can see the apex of the second molar is inside the dentigerous cyst. The lingual cortical plate of the cyst is disrupted. And there is expansion of the buccal as well as the lingual cortical plate. We'll see that better on the axial slice. So in a minute, we are going to review the axial slice. Further distally, we started picking up the impacted third molar. The inferior alveolar canal, as we saw on the panoramic radiograph, is displaced to the inferior border of the mandible. 
So here is the inferior alveolar canal. This is the root of the impacted molar. This is the canal and that's the distal part of the cyst. On the axial view, compare the normal left side with the cystic lesion on the right side. This is the buccal cortical plate and here we see that the buccal cortical plate is thin and expanded and we can appreciate significant expansion of the lingual cortical plate. So compare this with the left side. And here is a perforation of the lingual cortical plate. Here is another cropped panoramic radiograph. Now of the mandibular anterior region. The mandibular left canine, which should have been here, is horizontally impacted. The root of this canine is at the level of the inferior border of the mandible. We have a large radiolucent defect attached at the CEG of the impacted canine. This lesion extends from the apical area of the incisors to the inferior border of the mandible. So this is a dentigerous cyst. Here is another cropped panoramic radiograph, this time of the maxillary anterior region. This is an example of an impacted permanent canines on the right side and the left side. Since the follicle is about 3 mm wide on both sides, this may represent a hyperplastic follicle or an early stage of a dentigerous cyst. Cross-sectional imaging for this patient may help us to rule out any expansion of the labial or the palatal cortical plates. This is another example of a large dentigerous cyst associated with the mandibular right third molar. Again, this is a circumferential dentigerous cyst. Near the alveolar crest, this lesion attaches at the CEG. On the other side, the lesion wraps near the root. The inferior border of the mandible is significantly expanded. This radio opacity is the hyoid. There are two radiopaque entities, tonsillar calcifications. We can learn about this in a different video on soft tissue calcifications. This panoramic radiograph was acquired in December 2019. I have a CBCT scan to share with you. This is the CBCT scan of the same patient. Again, this is a mandibular scan. This blue line represents the slice here. So we are in the region of the mandibular right first molar. As we progress distally, we see that the buccal cortical plate is intact. The lingual cortical plate is perforated. And now we can appreciate the expansion of the cystic outline. There are areas of cyst on the buccal and lingual of the second molar. You can appreciate significant expansion of the cyst. The expansion may be best appreciated on the axial slice. This is the buccal cortical plate. Compare this with the normal left side. And this is the lingual cortical plate. Again, compare with the normal side. And you can appreciate a significant expansion by the dentigerous cyst. There are some areas of scalloping similar to a seashell. This is the same patient, imaged on September 10, 2020. This is nine months after the surgery. The thick wall is a sign of remodeling of the cyst. You can appreciate the amount of healing. The tooth is still present here. Again, we can appreciate the healing better on the CBCT scan. The blue line representing the slice here at the level of the first molar. As we go distally, 
this is the remodeling of the bone this density was earlier was radiolucent now new bone has started to fill in this is the area of the remodeling that's the inferior alveolar canal still buccally displaced and these are new bone forming around the cystic defect that's the tooth that caused the cyst on the 3d reconstruction you can still appreciate the expansion of the inferior border of the mandible on the axial slice the expansion has still remained however the radiolucency has been replaced by new bone looking at the timeline we have covered four cysts radicular residual buccal bifurcation and dentigerous cyst let us stop here now for part one of the odontogenic cyst videos please join me again on part two of the cyst video